What's cracking? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your boy, Nicholas. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football today. We're going to continue my early rankings videos. We've done the quarterbacks top 10. We've done the top 12 wide receivers. If you missed either of those, they'll be linked down in the description. We're moving to the juicy stuff. We're getting in the grip with the running backs. This is probably everyone's favorite episode. My favorite episode. I love doing the running backs because they are the heart and soul of your fantasy team. As you already know, I don't need to tell you this. One thing I do want to add in before I start is um, it, I have been turning these videos into podcasts. So my podcast is officially up on the iTunes store. And you could uh, it'll be one of the first links in the description. So I know a lot of you guys, like, I wouldn't be able to sit here and watch me for 50 minutes either. So if you want to listen to me rather than look at me, that is available. So go subscribe to the podcast. Please leave a rating and review so we can creep up there and move past some of the big heads in fantasy. That'd be dope. I'm going to bring you all along with me when we rise to the top. Don't you worry about that as I drink my poop. Anyways, we're doing the top 12 early running back rankings today. Half point PPR as always. And let's just get right into it. So, starting from the top, we're going to go number one, Le'Veon Bell. You've heard me talk about it on my channel already this summer. I'm taking Bell over Gurley. I'm taking him because of his consistency, his workload, his production, especially his involvement in the passing game, which is just head over heels, way higher in volume than any other running back. Maybe it wasn't that much higher than Gurley last year, but over a year, over year, over year, over year basis, Bell stays there. I'm not so sure Gurley will be there the whole time. Last year, he averaged over 27 touches a game. In 2016, it was over 28 touches a game. He led all NFL running backs in receptions last year with 85, and he's led the position in receptions per game each of the last two seasons. He has such a high floor especially in PPR leagues. Check out this chart. This is the average receptions per game over the last two seasons of any player in the NFL, running back, wide receiver, tight end, combined. He is, I think it was eighth on the list. Antonio Brown, Fitz, Jarvis, Keenan Allen, Michael Thomas, OBJ, Julian Edelman, who doesn't even really count because he didn't play 2017. That's how good he is in the passing game. Plus, he's getting like 20, 20-something 20 carries a game. Last year, only nine wide receivers had more catches than Le'Veon Bell. All five starting linemen are back in Pittsburgh. They ranked at number one in pass blocking last year, number seven in run blocking per football outsiders. They have incredible weapons on the outside, so you don't need to worry about uh, people stacking the bots. You never do with Le'Veon Bell and the Pittsburgh Steelers. It's just craziness. Him running the underneath routes and, and getting linebackers and safeties covering him, I don't really need to tell you any of this. Todd Haley is gone, which some people might say, like, what happens now? Randy Fitchner is their new offensive coordinator. He was promoted from within. He was their quarterback coach for the last eight seasons, so I highly doubt he's very involved, obviously, in what the offense has been doing. So it would be a shock to me if anything changed there in Pittsburgh. So we'll move right on to Todd Gurley, and I'm just going to move right on past him because Gurley is obviously the 1B to Le'Veon Bell's 1A. I would be completely happy with either of these guys as my RB1. I just prefer Bell. A lot of you guys will prefer Gurley. Like I said, I ain't going to be mad at either of you guys. So we're going to move on to number three, and that's Ezekiel Elliott. And according to current ADP, he's actually going as RB4 right now. I have him as the third. What I think is him coming into the season with a completely clear head, right? Last year, he was worrying about this, an overlooming suspension. We didn't know what was going to actually happen with that, right? So he came into the season... Uh, with a lot of other things on his mind, maybe he wasn't able to focus, and now he's ready to go beast mode, Zeke mode on him, right? And I love the position that he's in. He missed six games last year, right? Six games with the suspension. He is still number one in rushing yards over the last two seasons combined, despite missing six games with 2,615 rushing yards. He is so productive on the ground. He came close to Le'Veon Bell. Remember I said Bell averaged over 27 touches a game last year? Well, Zeke, in the 10 games that he did play, averaged 26.8 touches a game. That is crazy, crazy, crazy high numbers, of course. And that's always been their philosophy, and that's always been their motive when they're playing, right? They want to use a ground and pound. They don't They don't want to have Dak throw the ball 35, 40, 45 times a game because, you know, we've seen what happens when Dak does that. He came out. He came out a little bit last year, and we seen what Dak really might have been. We know exactly what they're doing. 
Dez is gone, and I don't really think that that is a major impact on Zeke in any way. I don't really think that shapes his fantasy outlook. Maybe instead of forcing the ball to Dez down there, they give Zeke a few more goal line rushes, which is great. Either way, I think he's guaranteed double-digit touchdowns next year, and that's probably like his floor, 10 touchdowns. Listen to this. Zeke has played in 26 career games in the NFL. He has scored 25 touchdowns, and he has averaged 24.9 touches per game. 26 career games, 25 career touchdowns, 24.9 touches per game in his career. So, as amazing as he's been, and as amazing as everyone thinks he is, I actually think he is underrated in fantasy football. I think him to Gurley is almost as close as Gurley to Bell, in my opinion humble-ass opinion. So, Zeke just goes into a great situation. Super consistent, always getting the touches, always scoring. He had one dud game last year against Denver, right, where he rushed for like 15 yards or something on nine carries. Something really, really bad like that. Other than that game, though, in all nine games, he had at least 115 total yards and or a touchdown. He was fantasy's running back two in standard leagues and running back three in PPR leagues on a points-per-game basis. Running back two in standard leagues. So listen to that. On a points per game basis in standard leagues, he finished above Le'Veon Bell. He's right there in the discussion. Uh, Their line is still very much top of the league. They were ranked fourth for both football outsiders and pro football focus last year. So they have that still intact. It's not like they're on the way down in in that sense. So he still has another year of top elite production from that offensive line. Of course, the thing that separates him from the top two guys is his involvement in the passing game. They talked about last summer, they're like, we want to get Zeke more involved. We want to get Zeke more involved in the passing game. And it did happen. He went from 2.6 targets a game in 2016 to 3.8 in 2017. That paces out to 61 targets on the season, the 3.8 last year he had, which is uh, almost identical to a guy like Kareem Hunt. And you, when you when you think about a guy like Kareem Hunt, you would never be like, oh, he's not that involved in the passing game. You think he is very involved in the passing game. So if Zeke's pacing out to the same numbers that Kareem Hunt is, plus the crazy rushing upside he had, there's no reason he can't finish as, you know, as the RB1. Um, and that number, if you paced out to 61 targets a game, is just a single target less per game than LaShawn McCoy last year. He only had two games all of 2016 with five targets. I'm talking about Zeke. Zeke had two games in 2016 with five targets. In 2017, in just 10 games, he had five targets in five games, five separate times. So if he keeps this up and he's still involved in the passing game as much as he was, there's no reason why he won't thrive. And yeah, they brought in Tavon Austin, who's going to take some uh, some rushes away, some short passes away. They brought in Michael Gallup to the draft, which you might say limits his upside. But listen, Dez is gone, and Jason Witten is retired. That is a lot of targets up for grab. I don't even think it's a wash. I actually think that's an upgrade for Zeke in the passing game because that's a ton of targets that they're that they're letting go of. And I'm actually not even sure off the top of my head how many targets they had. So I'm going to actually look that up live for you. See how many targets we get in bike. Des Bryant, 126 targets. Jason Witten, 81. So that is 207 targets up for grab. Love that. Man, I love Zeke this year. I would be ecstatic if he was my RB1. So that's, he's my number three. Number four, who is the current RB3 in According to this ADP, David Johnson, Arizona. We all love David Johnson. How could you not? Especially if you owned him in 2016. You know what he is capable of. I'll be honest, though. He makes me a little bit nervous this year in terms of people overdrafting him. And by overdrafting, I just mean taking him ahead of Zeke. My number one reason for concern, uh, if you're debating taking DJ ahead of Gurley, Zeke, or Le'Veon Bell, is that he averaged... 22.9 22.9 fantasy points per game in that season he had in 2016, right? Last year, Gurley topped that with 23.4 points per game. Thing is, David Johnson scored 20 touchdowns in 2016. And if there's ever been a statistic that screamed regression, it's that. 20 total touchdowns. You know, if you're being realistic with yourself, picking David Johnson, I think you'd probably be happy with 10 touchdowns. I think his realistic expectation should be somewhere from 7, 12 is probably the ceiling. You break that down, and if you're scoring 9 touchdowns, say, instead of 20, those points per game drop down pretty dramatically, and you're not really in the same realm as Gurley or Bell anymore. Believe me, I understand what David Johnson is capable of, and I understand his talents and how they're going to use him and his volume and everything. 
Uh, I just think the touchdown totals are what scares me a lot. There's no argument from the from the volume standpoint. He averaged 23.3 touches a game in 2016, which is still less than Bell, Zeke, Gurley. And he had 17 touches in week one last year before he left with the injury. So it's clear what the what the game plan was. What else makes me nervous is obviously the offense as a whole. We have a new quarterback in Sam Bradford. They they drafted Josh Rosen. Bradford, it's anyone's guess as long as he can stay healthy. You know, I don't even know if I could pencil him in for double-digit starts. Got no qualms with the man, but the offensive line is a huge concern. That's probably the reason Sam Bradford will end up getting hurt. They ranked 21st overall in 2017 per Football Outsiders, whereas in 2016, David Johnson's big year, they were the seventh best run blocking line per Football Outsiders. And Football Outsiders ranks them, uh, their offensive line rankings has nothing to do with how good the running back was. It's strictly on them. So they were really good in 2016 when David Johnson had that big year. Last year, they were really bad. Uh, PFF actually graded them out as the 31st ranked offensive line, and they were 29th in the NFL in yards before contact last year. Only Miami, Detroit, and Indy were worse. Even Seattle was better than them last year. Um, and get this, per PFF, on outside zone runs, their line averaged negative .21 yards before contact. And we know how good David Johnson is on those outside runs and, and hitting the edge and then exploding out. But he's going to be contacted negative .21 yards before contact if he was playing last year. So, I mean, they did go out and address the line a little bit. They signed Justin Pugh from the G-Men, a pretty big contract, five years, $45 million, which is definitely a boost to the line. But he did grade out as Pro Football Focus's 52nd graded tackle. And I'm not really sure if he's going to play guard or tackle there here in Arizona because I think he switched a lot in, in New York last year. It's just overall not a good situation for their line. We look at the coaching changes. They bring in Steve Wilkes as their new head coach. He's the former defensive coordinator for the Panthers, and they bring in Mike McCoy as their OC. Mike McCoy's experience, that doesn't mean he's good because a lot of these old heads in the NFL nowadays try to do what they've done overall to get where... You know what? You know what it is? You can't get to the next phase in your life expecting to do the same shit that got you there. And that's what a lot of these old heads do. They think like, oh my God, this game plan worked in 1995, so it's going to work in 2025. Not the case. That's what I'm a little nervous about with Mike McCoy. Now, we look back at some of the years Mike McCoy was an offensive coordinator. He was the offensive coordinator in Denver, 2010 to 2012, so three years. The top fantasy finishes for running backs under McCoy. 2010 was no Sean Moreno, finished as RB19. 2011 was Willis McGahee, RB24. 2012 was McGahee again, RB28. And I know the argument could be made very easily that David Johnson is a much better running back and he's going to get more volume and yada, yada, yada. But I just I just thought it'd be it's notable to you guys that those are the running backs under Mike McCoy as offensive coordinator. Denver didn't learn their lesson. Um, they decided to bring him back as an OC last year. And uh, y'all know how that went. So that's the thing. It's like these offense coordinators just get fired and then immediately just get picked back up. Like, why do you think they were fired? Like, why do you think they're not that good in the first place? So I'm all in on his talent and his workload, but there's a lot of moving parts here that I don't necessarily love. But the upside is so high that you can't let him fall anywhere lower than RB4. Which brings us to RB5, Saquon Barkley, the rookie, the number two draft pick in this year's NFL draft to the New York G-Men joints, currently going off the board, RB7. And uh, I've talked a lot about him. I have talked a lot about this man. He is just the epitome of savage in every way. Testing, measurables, production. His biggest upside, of course, in today's day and age is receptions, right? His reception and target total last year was higher than like nine of the fucking highest running back prospects is career targets and receptions combined. He's an animal. Spark score 99th percentile, just a ridiculous 40-yard dash given his like 230-pound, six-foot frame. And he goes to the G-Man where he's pretty much guaranteed 300 touches. And anyone who's going to get 300 touches is going to be a really top-notch fantasy producer. So if you're able to get Barkley, I think at like RB, get out of here, at like RB8, uh, like RB7 to 10, I, I really think you're getting him at his floor. The G-Men, their downside, of course, is their offensive line. They address that by getting Nate Solder so they don't, uh, at left tackle, so they don't have to play Eric Flowers at left tackle anymore. They drafted Will Hernandez, who is a bully, and he's going to be a really good piece for this offensive line. I think he should have went in the first round probably, but he fell to them. So they're addressing that problem. 
They have the new offensive coordinator, new head coach, Shula and Shermer. Shula's the OC. And looking back at them historically, those are coaches who run the ball a lot. So Barkley's workload, I think, is as safe as anything. Um, I was listening to a 4 for 4 podcast by John Paulson. That's one of my favorite fantasy football podcasts, by the way. 4 for 4 fantasy football. John Paulson talked about there have been like, I can't remember the exact numbers. Over the last eight years, there have been 15 rookie running backs with at least 200 touches in their rookie year. And the average of those guys has finished with like 290 touches, 1,300 total yards and like nine touchdowns. So Barkley's in good company there. And I'm really excited about him. I think he's just a a three down back that's going to get a ridiculous workload. You don't pick him second overall if you're not going to give him a Zeke or a Leonard Fournette type workload. I don't think I really need to explain any further. Uh, It's Quan Barkley. And we'll move to my number six guy. That's Leonard Fournette in Jacksonville. Yes, I will be taking him ahead of Kareem Hunt. This year, or as of now, before the preseason and, and the training camps and everything starts, he's currently going off the board as running back eight. I do think it's kind of a coin flip between Fournette and Hunt, but I, I just like what Jacksonville has going there. Um, the biggest concern for Fournette is his injury history, right? He dealt with lower leg injuries throughout college, and it kind of crept back up last year as well. But when he played, man, when he played his rookie season, he racked up over 1,340 total yards, 10 touchdowns on 304 touches in just 13 games. If you pace that out to 16 games, which obviously cannot be taken for granted, but it's not like you're taking a zero when he's not in there. Season long, 1,650 yards, 12.3 touchdowns, 44 catches, 374 overall targets. Only Zeke and Le'Veon saw more carries per game than Fournette did with his 20.6 carries per game. You know exactly what Jacksonville wants to do. Um, They are a ground and pound defensive minded team, and that's going to be their MO going forward for the next few years. Their line did a complete 180 flip from 2016 to 2017. They were one of the poorest ranked offensive lines in 2016. Last year, Ranked ninth overall per Football Outsiders, 1.95 yards before contact for running back, second in the NFL last year. They're a really, really good run blocking unit. So what did they do? Second best in terms of run blocking unit, they go out and sign Andrew Norwell, the best offensive lineman on the free agent market. Five years, 66.5 mil, 30 mil guaranteed, easily the highest paid guard in the NFL now. Oh, and he was just the third overall graded lineman per PFF last year. Huge addition to that line. My God, they have something good working there in Jacksonville. Chris Ivory is gone. Yeldon has another year on his contract, but I do like Corey Grant. If you're going to get Leonard Fournette, make sure you grab Corey Grant really, really, really late. Flashes of really good stuff. And actually, yeah, so I like the idea of handcuffing Fournette with Grant for a few of these backs, especially for Todd Gurley. If you draft Todd Gurley, draft the rookie John Kelly as a handcuff. Zeke is a little tougher. I guess they, they grabbed Bo Scarborough, but I don't think he would be a workhorse back if, or at least like a three down back if he got it. So that's that's my take on Fournette. They use him so heavily when he's there. Their line was already awesome. They signed Andrew Norwell, just got better, and you know they're going to give him the rock 20 to 25 times a game. So I love Fournette. He is my number six guy. And I want to take a break to just let you guys know, if you haven't already done known this, you probably do, but My ultimate draft guide is available for pre-order right now on my website, which I'll link here as well as in the description. In my draft guide, we will have the top 250 overall rankings. They will have positional rankings, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, kicker, defense even, broken down by tiers, which will help you during your draft. It'll have my top sleepers, my top busts, uh, my rookie dynasty rankings, my top 40 or 50 of them. It will have, oh man, a lot of stuff, top free resources, I I did a video on that, like top five. It'll probably have top 12 to 15. They'll have videos that you will not get on YouTube that will be exclusively in there. It's all interactive, so it's all right on your phone or on the computer or your tablet or whatever. It's going to be very cool. And I don't have the first issue out yet, so I can't actually show you what it looks like, but it's going to be awesome. If you grab it now, you're going to get it for a pre-order price on July 1st. The price will go up. It includes my Bible, which will be a big article that I write that will only be in there that breaks down position by position exactly how you should approach your draft this year in fantasy football, along with a bunch of other things. It's going to be really, really, really cool. So if you want to pre-order that, go do it. Again, link down there, and the price will go up on July 1st. So I appreciate everyone who has already ordered it, and don't worry, it is on the way. First issue will drop probably early to mid-July, so I'd say anywhere from July 1st to July 14th, maybe, something like that. 
anyways, just wanted to plug that in for those of you guys who were unaware there. All right, so we move to my number seven back. That's Kareem Hunt. Like I said, him and Fournette are basically like a coin flip for me. I love, I love Hunt. I love his vision. I love his power, his acceleration, his balance. You know, it's just a very good blend of intangibles that show up in a big way when you watch him play. Despite him catching 53 passes last year, which was tied for 11th most among running backs, Andy Reid said he wants to get Hunt even more involved in the passing game this year, which is a pretty good idea considering uh, he had an 85% catch rate, which ranked 6th among 41 running backs with at least, or qualified running backs, 6th among 41, and he averaged 8.6 yards per reception. So very productive in the passing game, and I'm really excited to see what they do with him this year, I know they brought in a bunch of no-name running backs, so I, I've actually seen a lot, of, not a lot, but a few comments saying that they're a little nervous about Hunt's workload because of this. Um, I'm not worried about that whatsoever. They're an after, a complete afterthought for me. The bigger question marks here are the fact that they are using a new quarterback, right? Alex Smith is out in Washington. They bring in Pat Mahomes, who they traded up for to get last year in the NFL draft, and now they're handing him the keys to the to the Kansas City Kingdom. What do we expect from Pat Mahomes? I think they're going to play it kind of conservatively here. I know he's got the big arm, and I'm sure they'll let him take shots downfield, but what better way to kind of get a quarterback comfortable than give him easy passes and easy routes um, to a guy like Kareem Hunt, right? So it's possible that they play it safe and, and Hunt's target totals actually go up. And uh, I just like the spot that Hunt's in. They do lose their offensive coordinator, Matt Nagy, um, but their replacement is, I'm not sure if I'm going to say this right or not. Let's try It's Eric. I think it's just Eric Benimi. Eric Benimi, he was the running backs coach. So if you're worried about Hunt getting less work, uh, I highly doubt that because Eric Benimi has been working with Kareem Hunt. He's the running backs coach, now the offensive coordinator. If anything, he knows exactly what Hunt is capable of, so he'll use him more. So no downside there. So I'm absolutely fine with Kareem Hunt as my RB1 in fantasy. He is my number seven ranked running back. And then we move to Alvin Kamara at number eight. He's currently going off the board as RB5. I expect that to move back a little bit. He put together one of the greatest rookie seasons out of all time for rookie running backs. 1,554 total yards, 13 touchdowns, 82 receptions. Barely broke the 200 touch mark. I know what the arguments are going to be against Kamara this year is why you wouldn't want to take him in the top 10 or one of the top eight running backs or whatever. It's one, Ingram is still there, still splitting the workload. Two, his efficiency was off the charts last year. There's no way he could repeat that. So to counter those arguments, one, yes, Ingram is still there, but he was there last year too. It's the same. And you have to remember the date Adrian Peterson in the beginning. So he was actually splitting work with two other guys, Kamara was. The way they started, Kamara started the season averaging just 6.6 .6 touches a game, 45 yards a game over their first three games, and he still finished as fantasy's RB3. So take Peterson out of the equation, take that slow start out of the equation. Instead of 6.6 .6 touches, Kamara will probably get 16.6 .6 touches. That is the thing that you have to remember. And it's not so much like Ingram is there, it's that he did it with Ingram and Peterson, you know what I mean? That leads, I guess, to the efficiency question. I'm not sure I can argue against that, that the efficiency is going to go down because it, it was off the charts last year. What I will say is that there's no way he doesn't pick up more volume, right? There's no way he doesn't break 250 touches this year. So his volume increase will offset his efficiency decrease, you know what I mean? I expect him to handle a really big workload out of the gate. And you even look at the end of last year in the playoffs and the last few weeks of the season, Kamara was out touching Ingram and out producing him wildly. So you saw as the season went on and the Saints were getting better and better and they were, even in the important games in the playoffs, Kamara was out touching Ingram. So you saw what the coaching staff saw, you saw how they wanted to utilize him and they, and they saw who their real running back one was. So it's not really a question of who it is anymore. It's a question of how much they're going to give to Kamara versus Ingram. Last year, he didn't have a single game with more than 12 carries on the year. You can argue the efficiency will decrease, but you can't really argue that the volume won't increase. He was already the third most targeted running back in the NFL with 101 targets. Add that to the increase in rushing volume. You might think of Kamara as one of those guys who is not a safe pick. And that usually occurs when guys have small volume and high efficiency. But I, I, I really think you should get that thought out of your head. And I think Kamara is safer than you would imagine this year. 
Um, and, you know, just looking at their offensive line, first overall in run blocking per football outsiders, fourth best per PFF in uh, yards before contact for running backs, one of the league's best, if not the best uh, in terms of run blocking. So the, it's just a great situation, in my opinion, for him. So he's number eight. Number nine, Melvin Gordon in L.A. with the charges. Currently going as running back nine off the board. There's just not much to dislike about him other than his, like, yards per carry numbers, right? I mean, he, he has not been efficient over, I think it's three years now. There's no signs that the Chargers are looking to change their game plan whatsoever. He's seeing the volume. 341 touches in 2017, which is 21.3 touches a game. He's finished as a top seven fantasy running back in back-to-back seasons. He has a 3.9 yards per carry career number, like I said, but you know they're insistent on using him as their bell cow. Plus, it's not all his fault. You know He did what he could He ranked second in the NFL in tackles avoided last year, fourth in total yards created per player profiler, and seventh in tackles avoided per attempt among uh, all running backs with 160 carries. So he was actually not bad in his own right. The problem was their offensive line, right? They ranked 23rd in run blocking per football outsiders, 22nd in yards um, before contact for running backs, and 24th overall per pro football Focus. So, and the yards per carry is obviously a number that should not be looked too heavily into. It's like a catch percentage thing because that doesn't take into account stacked boxes, uh, how well your your line blocked or anything like that. So, it's not a good stat to just look at and be like, oh, he's not that good. What I will say is they made some upgrades to the line, which is good, right? Their center last year, Spencer Pulley, graded as the 33rd amongst 34 graded centers in PFF last year. So he was almost the worst center in the league. They bring in Mike Pouncey to replace him. They signed him from the Miami Dolphins, who, who, when healthy, which has been a problem, is a big upgrade. So they're taking their weakness in the line and trying to make it a strength. They also get back last year's second-round pick in Forrest Lamp, um, who tore his ACL in the preseason. So he was slated to be a starter there, uh, and now they'll have him back. So their line's going to be much improved this year. Uh, which should boost Melvin Gordon's numbers. Oh, they get fucking um, Derwin James. What a steal they got. My God, their D-backs, their defense is going to be filth, or the D-backs at least are going to be filthy this year. And that always plays into the hand of running backs to see Leonard Fournette last year. So I'm a big fan of Melvin Gordon this year just because he's going to get the volume. They've improved offensive line, very good defense, and they've just proven that they want to use him over and over and over again. So... Can't hate on Melvin Gordon. Dalvin Cook is my number 10 guy. He's also the ADP running back 10. I love me some Dalvin Cook. Reminds me so much of Devonta Freeman, both from FSU. And I said the same thing when he when he entered the league too, man. I just does everything well. Clear third down back, um, three down back, excuse me. The concern here is obviously that he's coming off the ACL injury, but the Vikes knew what they had in Cook. He won that starting job like that in the summer. Um, and you saw how they used him from weeks one to four. He averaged 20, over 21 touches a game and over 111 yards from scrimmage. Scored twice, and he was fantasy's running back eight in that span from weeks one to four. Uh, that pace obviously would have given him high-end RB1 numbers, but the health thing was an issue. I don't think he really dealt with too many injuries in college, so I'm willing to chalk it up as fluky, I guess. So I'm absolutely fine picking Dalvin Cook in the top 10 of my running backs. They bring in Kirk. The offense should be very good with all the weapons they have. I like when I draft featured running backs in good offenses. That's how fantasy football works. You got a guy who's a feature back, three downs, does it all in a good offense. Things tend to usually work out for the best as long as he's healthy. So it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever to see Dalvin Cook finish as a top five fantasy running back in 2018. My running back 11 is LaShawn McCoy. Shady's a tricky one this year because he's just been so good for the last, you know, for for his whole career basically as a fantasy running back. And he finished last year as running back seven, but he had his lowest yards per carry total of his career. And he turns 30 this year. One nugget that I think you guys will find interesting, which I'll throw up on the screen per Mike Clay. He set a five-year low in percentage of carries from shotgun formations in 2017. And this was something I talked about yesterday in my, or the other day in my rookie video, um, when I was referring to Ronald Jones, I was talking about how some running backs dips off dramatically when they change from under center to shotgun. And this was the case for McCoy. Just 17% of McCoy's carries came out of the shotgun last year. 83% in 2013 under Chip Kelly. And the results were way, way worse. He averaged a career worst 
3.97 yards per carry last year. Um, he's always been an elusive back in uh, in space, so getting him into a shotgun position is great because he can see the line, you can see which moves he has to make. So they get rid of Rick Dennison, right, and bring in Brian Dobal. He was Alabama's offensive coordinator slash quarterback coach. And yes, I mean Alabama as in the college. Um, though Dobal... Spent 11 total seasons with the Pats and as the offense coordinator for the Browns, the Dolphins, and for Kansas, Kansas City. It didn't go well for him in any of those spots as the offense coordinator, so it's not a guaranteed upgrade if we're going to be honest here. We'll have to see how that works out. I don't know, bringing in college coaches, and we've seen that not work out for the most part. But what else is really concerning for Shady's outlook is his offensive line. They... Um, took a, a big step back last year, and I expect them to take an even further step back this year. They were really good in 2016. They, I believe they were the number one offensive line in terms of yards before contact. I think he, they gave Shady like 2.8 yards before contact on, on an average run in 2016. That number, I mean, they weren't terrible last year, but it was not the same line as in 2016. Now they lose Eric Wood to retirement. Richie Incognito to retirement. They traded away Cordy Glenn. They take a big hit on this offensive line. They also like don't have a quarterback. I mean, they have two quarterbacks, two shitty quarterbacks, which means you basically don't have a quarterback. They bring in A.J. McCarron. They draft Josh Allen with their number seven overall pick, which they traded up for. I just don't think it's going to be a pretty, a pretty situation in Buffalo. And for the most part, when you have a guy like Tyrod Taylor under center, uh, running backs tend to perform way better when they have a rushing quarterback because not, you can't just focus on Shady in the run game, right? You have to focus. One of the linebackers has to key in on the quarterback, so that takes one guy out of the equation. So even if you have a stack box, you're pretty much still running against a regular box. And that's, you know, it's another downside for Shady. So he's still going to be heavily involved in the passing game, but if he can't, there's just a lot of a lot of red flags when I look at Shady in the running game. So that's why I have him as number 11. Before we get to our final last running back, I want to say thank you to our sponsors. If you haven't already noticed, I'm rocking their gear right now. It's FantasyJocks.com. They are the world's number one supplier of fantasy sports, any sport, fantasy baseball, fantasy football, fantasy basketball, league equipment. I'm talking about dope fantasy football belts. They got rings. They got tro awesome trophies like Lombardi trophies. You can get... The team name of the champion, whoever won your league, engraved on this. You can get it engraved on the trophy. They have draft boards if you guys do live drafts. And tell me, I'm telling you, if you look at my live draft videos from the last few years, we use all of their stuff. Their draft boards are awesome. Um, it comes with kits, so you can get like, you could tell them how many teams you got, and it's like 24 rounds. They give you all the player stickers, markers to mark stuff off. They give you koozies for the team, the team members, um, timer. All this stuff is included. So what I suggest is have everyone buy in a little bit more, right? If you throw 50 towards your buy-in, tell everyone to throw in 58 or tell everyone to throw in 65 instead of 50 and you can get one of the belts. That thing will last you forever. Very good quality. Thank you again to our sponsors, fantasyjocks.com. It will be linked down below in the description. So go check them out for all your fantasy sports needs. And now we move to number 12. I actually have two guys tied at number 12 here. Interesting. I didn't even realize that when I wrote this. The two guys I have tied at number 12 are Devonta Freeman and Joe Mixon. I like both of them this year. Um, and honestly, I probably might move both of them ahead of LaShawn McCoy now that I'm thinking about it. But we'll talk about Devonta Freeman first. And before we write him off completely for a little bit of a down year last year, I won't, you know, we look at Steve Sarkeesian, right? He came in and absolutely destroyed this offense. And I mean that in the worst way possible. Your prior Kyle Shanahan really set shit up nicely. We were the league's top scoring offense last year. That number dipped back down to like 22 points a game. We were not that good. However, Kyle Shanahan's first year, we were only averaging 21 points a game. Then he took the big step. Sarkeesian, 22 points a game. I want to give him at least another year to see what manifests in this offense before I'm like, you know, I get the pitchforks. I'm trying to stab him out of, out of Atlanta. He's being picked right now as running back 14, Devonta Freeman. And I think that's just far too low. He finished last year as running back 11 in points per game. Despite playing with a sprained MCL and PCL down the stretch last year, and you could tell that a little bit of his explosion was gone because of the injury. He's a smaller back, but that's the first time he's really been injured in his entire career, right? He's played the full 16 in the other in the other season, so injury is not a concern for me. When you look at the games he played in last year, he played in technically 14 games. One of the games, uh, week 10, he left with a concussion after two carries. So we'll discount that and say he played in 13 games. 
If you look at his points per game numbers in those 13 games, he was a top 10 fantasy back again, right now being picked as running back 14. The big question mark here is you could see the drop in his involvement in the passing game. Targets per game have gone down each of the last three years. Same thing with the receptions per game. To be honest with you, I am not really sure what to make of this. I'm actually going to look up on Sharp Stats. SharpFootballStats.com is a great free resource you could use to check out like frequency in terms of personnel on the field and like percentage of passes going to what position and things like that. I want to see the percentage of pass plays for Atlanta that went to running backs this year as compared to last year to see if it was an overall team thing or if it was just a Devonta Freeman thing. Target rate, Atlanta, two running backs, 19%. The league average is 21%. So they're below average. When we look at two, six, 2016, I feel like this number is going to be way higher. 22%. The league average is 18. Only a few teams had higher. So their target rate to the running backs dropped pretty dramatically. Um, unfortunately, there's only statistics for 2016 and 2017. So I can't look at 2015. But it looks like that might be part of Star Steve Sarkeesian's kind of game plan, which is not very good. You know, it's anyone's guess as to how involved he's going to be in the passing game. But take that with a little bit of a caught uh, with a little bit of caution. So what I did like about Freeman's season last year were his goal line numbers and his involvement down there. He was third in the NFL in terms of carries inside the five yard line with 14 of them. That's despite missing basically three full games, still heavily involved down there. Um, and then when you look at this chart, I take this as a positive. Devonta Freeman and Julio Jones were looking at their 10 zone targets, so from the 0 to 10 yard line and the red zone, 0 to 20. Look at their involvement down there. Julio, you see his involvement down there went up by a crazy number from 2016 to 2017. Devonta Freeman has dropped down heavily. And that's, you know, that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying he's less involved in the receiving game. So it's not, I mean, you know, it's not a certainty that we can make conclusions based off this, but I feel like during the offseason, right, everyone talked about how you need to get Julio more involved. We need to get him more involved. He's not getting enough end zone looks. You need to force him the ball down there, and they did that, and it did not work. He only had one uh, 10 zone target turned into a touchdown, three, tu three touchdowns overall. So they kept feeding him and forcing him the ball, and it didn't work, and maybe – they stop listening to the outside sources and, and they think about what's best for the team. And they go back to feeding Freeman the ball because he's so, you know, give him a swing pass, let him operate in space where he works so well. And I think those numbers will increase a little bit. Like, how do you go from seven 10 zone targets to one on the year when you're that talented and that good in space? So I think the fact that we saw Julio's numbers rise dramatically, Freeman's drop so dramatically, I think it's a good thing to see. I, I think they're going to regress back to the norm or progress back to the norm, whatever you want to say. So there are definitely things to be worried about just his involvement in the passing game overall. But I, I think if there's any regression back to the norm for Freeman, then he'll be a perfectly fine top 10 running back again. And we had him tied with, like I said, Joe Mixon. Love Joe Mixon coming into the year as a clear workhorse, something that he was not last year. Uh, that backfield's all his. They are doing a really good job of addressing that offensive line, trading for Cordy Glenn from the Bills. They picked Billy Price with their first round um, draft pick this year. So that addresses left tackle, that addresses center, two of their weak spots. And uh, I just, you know, he's just super talented. He's going to be very involved in the passing game, very involved in the rushing game. This offense should be much better than it was last year, given all the problems that they had. As soon as they switched over to Bill Lazier, or Lazer as their offensive coordinator, like week three or four, things started picking up a little bit. Andy Dalton started playing better. Joe Mixon started getting more involved. So I just really like his spot heading in. And Joe Mixon at 12, I think, as your running back 12, he's getting picked as running back 15 right now, is an absolute steal because he's guaranteed 20 touches a game pretty much. Um, and it would not surprise anyone to see him finish as a top five back. So that is going to wrap up the top 12 running back rankings, early rankings for the 2018 fantasy football season, season, season. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed and you got some value from it. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll have fantasy football videos all summer into the season. Help you win a... Help you win that chip. Help you win that, hopefully, Fantasy Jocks football ring. Go pre-order the draft guide if you want my positional rankings by tier. Check out the podcast, too. Subscribe. Leave a rating and a review for your boy. That would be very much appreciated. Anyways, next video will probably be... I think I'm going to do a mock draft now that the NFL draft is done. I'll do a mock draft. Then I have to get my top 10 tight end rankings videos out because that's the last of the positional rankings. And then, I don't know, I'll ask you guys what you guys want after that, and then we'll figure it out. So... Drop a comment down below if you want to talk that talk. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow.